Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Some of you may be unhappy right now in your life because there's something stuck back there that you've been hiding from, avoiding, evading, not facing, not dealing with. And you're not ever going to be happy until you go back and take care of that. It may be somebody you need to forgive. It may be something that you did that was wrong in your life and there would be a place now for you to correct it, but you just don't want to go back and mess with it. You know, there was a time in my life when, way before I even met Dave, when I stole some money from a company that I worked for. I was married to a man that was a petty thief and he talked me into stealing some money from this company and we ran out of town and went to another state. And after I got serious in my walk with God many years later, married to Dave, had some kids by now, it was 1970s, God was calling me into ministry. One day I felt like that God made it very clear to me that I needed to go back and face that situation and pay that money back and tell them what I did. Now, that frightened me because I thought, well, you know, what if, what if they have me arrested? What if this? What if that? You know, anytime you get ready to confront something in your life, there's always going to be a lot of what ifs that the devil is going to put in your head. And I went back and explained the situation told them I was a Christian, I felt like God had dealt with me that I needed to pay the money back. And I think it actually caused them to respect me, that I would own up to what I did, take responsibility for it. People don't respect us when we run from things. They respect us when we say, I was wrong, I'm sorry, I take responsibility for it, I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't have acted like that. But we're always trying to avoid something and, and evade something. And there was a time in my life when God told me that I had to go and confront my father. That terrible secret that had always been in our family that nobody ever talked about. That incest, the sexual abuse, and I'd always been extremely afraid of my father. I mean, so afraid of him that I would shake when I got around him. And the very thoughts of me going and saying to him, we need to talk about what you did to me was about the scariest thing that I could imagine. But the day came when God said, today is the day. And I went and I did that. And I'm not trying to tell you what to do. It's up to God to tell you what to do. I'm not saying if you stole something, you need to do what I did, but I'm not saying that maybe you shouldn't either. I'm just saying that there's things that we don't deal with that bother us. And sometimes we bury them so deep inside that we don't even know what's bothering us. There's just something bothering us and we blame it on all kinds of things. And there are things that we can't go back and fix. All we can do is just ask for forgiveness. But there are times when God also wants us to make restitution. Does anybody believe that? Amen. Now I got, a, I got a bunch of wide-eyed people out there because right now you're thinking about all the stuff that you've left unfinished in your life. <laughs> and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I should have come here today or not. It's so wonderful to just get things off your chest, get free from them, you know, just be free from them. Well, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, we have a situation about King David, who had committed adultery, killed the, the woman's husband that he had committed adultery with. This is King David, the beloved of the Lord, the one who said, I am God's anointed, the shepherd who sang all the songs, wrote all the psalms, and here he committed this terrible sin. I won't go into this, but it's a good point to make that the Bible says that when kings went to battle, David stayed home. Not something he normally did, but I guess he got a lazy spell on him. A passive spell. 
And instead of being out there with his men confronting the enemy like he should have, he stayed home. And he saw Bathsheba on the roof taking a bath. And that was his downfall. If he would have been where he was supposed to be, come on now. Some of you wouldn't get in trouble if you'd be in church on Sunday morning where you're supposed to be. Some of you wouldn't get in trouble if you'd be spending that time with God in the morning like you're supposed to. There's value in just being where you're supposed to be. But anyway, David, this great man of God, a man that God said of David, he's a man after my own heart. He not only committed this sin, but for a whole year, he managed to totally ignore what he'd done. It was eating away at him for sure, but I'm sure he was doing just what we do a lot of times. He was blaming it on this and blaming it on that. So often we blame, oh, it's the devil, the devil, the devil. Don't know what happened to my joy. <laughs> and so God sent someone to speak to David, a prophet named Nathan. I think a lot of times God sends people to speak to us. He sends people to confront us about situations, and all we do is get mad at them. Well, you ain't, you're, not, you're not so perfect yourself. <laughs> Come on. Now, perhaps God has sent me here today to confront somebody, to confront some issues in your life. I don't do it because I think it's fun to do. I do it because I really, more than anything else, I want people to have what Jesus died for them to have. I want you to have peace and righteousness and joy in the Holy Ghost. And I want you to be a fruit-bearing Christian that God can be proud of. Amen? And the only way that's going to happen is if I try to help you confront issues and stop running and avoiding and evading and there's many different ways that we run from things. We're going to talk today about some of the ways that we run from things. But today I want to talk to you especially about confronting your own bad behavior, confronting your own carnality, confronting and dealing with your own sin. Now don't even think about all the people you wish were here today. Oh, man, this would have been great for my husband. Wow, I wish my mom was here today. Well, they're not, but you are. And so I don't even want you to listen to this like you're listening to it for somebody else. This is for you, and God has something to say to every person. Second Samuel 12, 1, and the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came and he said to him, there were two men in a city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and brought up, and it grew up with him and his children. It ate of his own morsel, drank from his own cup, lay in his own bosom, and was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, and to avoid taking one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfaring man who had come to him, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for his guest. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this is a son worthy of death. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. It never ceases to amaze me how much we can find wrong with everybody else <laughs> while totally ignoring the issues in our own life. Matter of fact, I think that's one of the things that Satan uses probably more than anything else to keep us from growing is he gets us looking at what's wrong with everybody else. And in the process of that, <clears throat> we don't deal with our own stuff. You see, here's the thing you need to realize today. Whatever is wrong with everybody else, you can't do anything about it.
Having an opinion won't change them. Gossiping about them won't change them. Most of the time, even you talking to them won't change them. Only God can change people. Because only God can get inside of us and change us from the inside out. But you can cooperate with the Holy Spirit and let Him make the changes in you that need to be made. And I can tell you the truth, and I know this by experience. You may think right now that if so-and-so doesn't change, you can never be happy. But I can tell you right now, if you change enough, you can be happy no matter what they do. You are the man. Well, David did repent, and God went on to use him, although there were some repercussions throughout his life for what he had done. How much fleshly, carnal behavior have you just kind of gotten used to in your life that you're not dealing with that you should be dealing with? 1 Corinthians 13, 11 says, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But now that I've become a man, I'm done with childish ways. I'd love for some people in here today to reach that place of transition in your life where you say, if I'm going to be a Christian at all, then I'm going to be a passionate, full-on, seriously committed Christian and I'm going to learn to be Christ-like in my behavior if it's the last thing I ever do. If God can use my words today to motivate those of you that are here today to make that kind of a commitment to God and never back off of it, my trip here will be a huge success as far as I'm concerned. What kind of sins am I talking about today? I'm not even going to talk about the big ones. There's not much chance that you're planning to go rob the bank when you leave here today. You're probably not going to do that. You're probably not going to go steal food from the grocery store. But there is a chance that you'll complain and murmur before the day's over. Maybe even about something that went on here in the meeting. There's a chance you might judge somebody else or gossip, have an opinion you don't need to have because really the truth is, is what you have an opinion about is really, really none of your business. Maybe you would have a little rebellion toward authority or some greed or some selfishness, some impure thoughts, some unforgiveness, some jealousy, some envy, a bad temper. Division, strife, drunkenness. You might be unthankful or ungrateful, but you go to church. <laughs> well, I go to church. I'm even a greeter once a month. I am so tired of hearing Christians tell me where they go to church and watching the stupid stuff they do. If you are going to break the speed limit when you drive, get the bumper sticker off your car. If you're going to go to work and spend two hours of your day on personal phone calls and surfing the web, then get the cross from around your neck. Nothing should be any more important to us than personal integrity. 
I love what King David said. He said, I walked in my house with integrity. And I love that. He didn't just put on a show for everybody else, but behind closed doors when nobody was looking, he still really made an effort to do what he believed was right. He had that period in his life where he sinned and he got away from God. That can happen to people. Thank God his mercy's new every day. It is so hard today to find somebody who will even say, I'll call you back tomorrow and have them do it. I'm tired of that nonsense. If you're not going to tell me the truth, then please just don't tell me anything. Now. Do you want to know God, or do you want to just know what God can do for you? You know, I went through a time in my life where God told me, I don't want you to ask me for one thing until I give you permission to. The only thing I want to hear out of you is God, I need you. So I would start to say, well, God, you really need to change that. <laughs> well, God, I just need more of you. <laughs> well, I rebuke the devil and God, I pray that my ministry would grow. Uh, 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 well, never mind, God. <laughs> I just need you. Well, that went on for six months. God wouldn't let me ask for anything. When I tried to, it would stick like fish bones in my throat. And I learned to seek God's face and not his hand. And you'll find when you seek God's face that his hand will always be open. But if you just seek God for what he can do for you and you're not seeking him, then you're always going to be a carnal, baby, immature, fleshly Christian that may squeak in the back door of heaven. I'm not talking about your salvation. Your salvation is not based on your good behavior. It's based on the death and resurrection and the blood that was shed by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But I'll tell you what we are talking about here today. We're talking about how much are you going to enjoy, enjoy the trip? Are you going to have peace? Are you going to have joy? Are you going to be respected? Are you going to bear good fruit? Are people going to look at you and say, I want what you've got? Or are they going to look at you and say, hypocrite? <laughs> Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. By the time Paul wrote this, I guess he'd already written a large portion of the New Testament. And yet Paul says in verse 10 of Philippians 3, for my determined purpose is that I might know him. Well, he already knew God. So here the man who already knew God wants to know God more and more deeply and more intimately. Let's actually go through this. I want you to see this on the screen. It's rather long, but the language is just beautiful. For my determined purpose is that I might know him, that I might progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly. And that I might in that same way come to know the power outflowing from his resurrection, which it exerts over believers. And that I may so share his sufferings as to be continually transformed in spirit into his likeness, even to death in the hope that if possible, I might attain to the spiritual and moral resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead, even while I'm in the body. Now, Paul didn't just say that he wanted a resurrection. He said, I know that I may have to do some suffering to get it. 
I said last night there are no padded crosses. Jesus died for our sins, but we will all have to die to self. <laughs> you're going to have to die to gossiping. You're going to have to die to that temper. You're going to have to humble yourself and start forgiving the people who hurt you because after all, you do more wrong than they do anyway. I got one person down here in the second row agreeing with me. Is anybody with me today? Yeah. <laughs> see, the problem is, is we don't see what we do because we're too busy looking at what they do. <laughs> we look at everybody else through a magnifying glass, but we look at ourselves through these rosy colored glasses. And there's no excuse for you to behave that way, but I always have a reason. Actually, the stuff that Paul wrote here just, <laughs> I can feel the man's passion. In verse 9, he says, and that I might actually be found and known as in him. He already knew he was in Christ. He was already teaching other people about being in Christ. And yet here he is saying that I might be found and known as in him, not having any righteousness of my own. That supposed righteousness which you get through good works, but only the righteousness which he gives. Paul wanted a deeper revelation that he was nothing without God. I tell you the truth, we just are not deep enough. <laughs> and by deep, I don't mean going around going. <laughs> Did you feel it? Did you feel it? <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm talking about walking in the spirit, not walking in the flesh. I'm talking about living deeper beyond what you want, what you think, and what you feel. Talking about laying your life on the line, and instead of telling God every morning the six things you have to have to stay saved, say, here I am, God, what can I do for you today? What do you need me for today, Lord? Who can I bless? Who can I encourage? Who can I compliment? Out by the end of this day, God, I want somebody's life to be better today because I was alive and breathing. Did you hear me? By the end of the day, I want somebody's life to be better because I was alive and breathing. I wasted too much of my, left in my life in me, 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 and I don't want to do that anymore. That I might be found and known as in Him. Paul said, I, I had it all, man, education. I was in the right social group. I'm sure he had finances. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I mean, like the top upper echelon of religious life. And he said, you know what it all is? It's dumb. Poo-poo. <laughs> Compared to the priceless privilege of knowing him and being found as in him and going deeper in him. You better start getting rid of some of those things in your life that are keeping you from God. If you're too busy for God, then there's some stuff in your schedule that needs to go, and it shouldn't be God. Don't ever try to work God into your schedule. Work your schedule around God. Now, Ephesians 4, 15. Let our lives lovingly express truth in all things. Speaking truly, dealing truly, living truly, enfolded in love, let us grow up in every way and in all things unto him who is the head. Today, I believe that God wants to reveal some truth to each and every one of us about us. It's time to stop running and start facing issues. 
Well, there are several ways that we can run from our problems, but the only way to conquer them is to face them head on.